everyone and welcome to the episode number eight of the All Atlantic Talks podcast, an initiative that has the aim of strengthening the visibility of the All Atlantic Ocean Research Alliance, its key stakeholders, joint pilot actions and connected projects and initiatives. So is initiative organized by CONFAP with the support by the European Commission within other participants. So this is the episode number eight of the All Atlantic Talks podcast. We will talk about Atlantic ecosystems, assessments, forecasting and sustainability. And with us today, we have several special guests. We have Mrs. Eloise Trabut of the Stazione Zoologica in Italy and Atlant Eco Project Manager. Welcome, Mrs. Tabut. Hi, and thank you for having us on the podcast today. It's a pleasure to have you with us. Also, we have Dr. Hugo Sarmento of the Federal University of San Carlos in Brazil, professor at the Laboratory of Microbial Processes and Biodiversity. Welcome, doctor. Thank you very much for the invitation and the opportunity to talk about Atlantico. It's a pleasure to have you here. Also, we have Dr. Linda Maral Zettler at Royal. He's a researcher, leader at the Department of Marine Microbiology and Biogeochemistry at the Royal Netherlands Institute of Sea Research in Netherlands. Welcome, Doctor. Thank you very much. I'm happy to be here. Happy to have you here as well, Doctor. And also we have Dr. Marcelo Vicky of the University of Cape Town in South Africa. Dr. Vicky is professor at the Department of Oceanography and director at the Marine and Antarctic Research Center for Innovation and Sustainability. Welcome, Dr. Vicky. Thank you. Thank you very much, Carlo. And thank you so much for inviting me. Thank you very much. So let's start our podcast. Remember, the focus of the podcast of today is discussing the role of the Atlantic microbiome in driving the dynamics of Atlantic ecosystem. So the first question is, which are the overall objectives? of the Atlantic Eco Project and how does this initiative contribute to reinforce the All Atlantic Ocean Research Alliance? Please, Mrs. Tabot. Yeah, sure. So to start with, so the main aim of the Atlantic Eco Project is to develop a framework to better understand marine ecosystems through linking observations, numerical and socioeconomic models to make available tools and resources, as well as policies that will help to better manage the Atlantic Ocean, its resources and the services it provides through its ecosystems. Now, to do this, we have designed the objectives around four activity streams. The first one is to map the current state of marine ecosystem composition, functioning health and services using high quality data at a global scale. And to do this, we are assessing the dynamics of Atlantic marine ecosystems, the provision of services through these ecosystems and lay of both with socioeconomic activities. The second objective is to generate new digital knowledge from scientific expeditions and citizen science using innovative numerical models. And through this, we are increasing our knowledge and the amount of data available on microbiomes, plastics and the plastosphere, and gaining a better understanding on how the different regions of the ocean connect and interact. And to do this, we're using standardized approaches from sampling strategies, novel genomics, imaging and biogeochemical methods, to inform bioinformatic and modeling approaches. The third aim and objective is to forecast changes and the impacts of human and climatic pressures on complex ecosystems using eco-socioeconomic models. To do this, we will assess and aim to predict the cumulative impacts of multiple stresses on the ecosystem status, dynamics, and the ecosystem service provisions. So we will identify drivers and roles on tipping points, assessing changes in recovery of ecosystem structures, functions and services, as well as developing eco-socioeconomic models to predict future trajectories. And finally, we want to share and use all of the knowledge that we will have gained, making all the data available via open databases, and we also have a system-wide strategy to build capacity and transfer knowledge to achieve successful engagement between science, industry, 
policy in society. And to answer the second part of your question, how do we contribute to the All Atlantic Ocean Research Alliance? Well, this takes many forms. We have collaboration which spans three continents around the Atlantic Basin. We have 11 countries in Europe. We have Brazil in South America and South Africa in Africa. We connect the North and South Atlantic, not only through scientific collaborations with approaches such as the deployment of standardized methods and protocols and the development of tools which consider the connection and interactions between the different regions of the Atlantic, to understand and manage the health of this ocean. But we also have a broad range of cross complementary activities. For example, in capacity building, we've just completed our first hands-on practical training course in South Africa, where a cohort of young researchers came together from 11 countries in Africa to gain knowledge and experience on the Atlantic Goals. They are now back in their labs and sharing that knowledge and growing the network. In Atlantico, we are also very lucky to have flagship vessels involved in all the activities, such as Tara and the Velero Eco, which are sailing around the southern parts of the Atlantic, along the Brazilian and Western African coasts. And this specifically to contribute to Atlantico sampling and data collection. This represents a unique opportunity for artists especially the younger researchers to come together, to come together on board of these boats to share and gain experience and to collaborate with team members from the three continents we have represented in the project. We also have a program of outreach and ocean literacy with the development of tools and resources that respond to a local context and specific needs identified by local communities. There, we collaborate with organizations such as the Two Oceans Aquarium Foundation in South Africa and the Blue School Network, which is well established in Brazil. And with the involvement of Tara Eco, there are port calls organized where events involving the public, local schools and local decision makers and stakeholders take place so that we can make a link between science and society, discussing the local challenges and opportunities for improvement. Perfect, perfect. Thank you very much, doctor. So the second question is for Dr. Hugo Sarmento. Doctor, I would like to know more about the microbiome scientific pillar of the project and its importance in the context of the Atlantic ecosystem. Doctor, the floor is yours. Thank you, Carlo. Not many people are aware that uh, half of the oxygen production in our planet is done in the sea. And the particularity is that in the ocean, this oxygen production is made by microorganisms. We cannot see these uh, primary producers very easily. In land, for example, the tropical rainforests, is easy to imagine how the nutrients go from the roots to the leaves to make photosynthesis. But how does it happen in the ocean? So in the ocean, the currents carry the microorganisms to the surface where there is light. And there we have primary production carried out by this phytoplankton. So the fact that these are invisible to the naked eye makes more difficult to study and more difficult to understand their role. But they're actually very important. So the microbiome is the group of all microorganisms that uh, live in the sea and that work together to make the ecosystem function. So the microbiome provides food for larger organisms like fish and whales. It is the link between the climates and the fisheries because the water movements of the ocean currents and, and changes in temperature and climates are transferred to the ecosystem through the basis of the ecosystem, which is uh, the microbiome, and then it affects fisheries, carbon sink, and other ecosystem services. So how do we study these organisms that we cannot see? We use a lot of DNA sequencing. Most of our knowledge or a lot of new knowledge has been generated with these new technologies of sequencing to sequence the microbiome of the ocean. So in Atlanteco, we are doing that more intensively and comprehensively, applying the similar protocols in different regions of the Atlantic Ocean. The nice thing is that we can uh, 
transfer these technologies from the northern hemisphere to the southern countries like Brazil and South Africa, and also do a lot of capacity building to our students that are able to learn these new techniques and uh, go on board of these flagship cruises and uh, explore about the microbiome research. Thank you very much, Dr. Sarmento. So continue with the same, the same point about to Dr. Linda Amaral Zettler. Dr. Zettler, I would like to talk about the scientific pillar focused on the plastics and the platysphere and how the bull growth targets are affected under this perspective. Dr. Zettler, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you, Carlo. Yeah, so the plastics in the plastosphere pillar of Atlantico is dedicated to researching one of the most pressing environmental challenges of our generation, and that is the unprecedented accumulation of plastic waste in our ocean. And we like to refer to the thin layer of life that covers every piece of plastic litter as the plastosphere, likening it to the thin layer of life on planet Earth, the biosphere. This is more or less a largely microbial habitat, depending on the size of the pieces of plastic, which most people like to think about large pieces of plastic dominating the litter in our ocean. But in fact, it's these tiny little pieces that are sometimes referred to as the plastic soup out there in the very middle of the ocean gyres, as we call them. And um, unfortunately, this is an expanding habitat. And if the current trends in plastic pollution, that is plastic production, use, waste generation, and effectively waste mismanagement continue, then by 2050, an estimated 12 billion metric tons of plastic waste will have accumulated on our planet. Now, I actually like to think of what we call planet Earth as really planet ocean. And um, because we know that more than 70% of the surface of the Earth is covered by ocean. And as it relates to ecosystem services, there are just so many services that the ocean provides us with. Now, unfortunately, even though the most conceivably pristine parts of the Atlantic are still very much pristine, fortunately, they are now no strangers even to plastic marine debris from the very depths of the ocean to the poles uh, in the Antarctic and the Arctic. Now, in terms of what plastics and the plastosphere can serve to inform with respect to blue growth, we can think about the role that microplastics contamination, and again, that is the largely the breakdown of larger pieces of plastic into these smaller pieces, less than five millimeters in size. We can think about their role that they might play, for example, in impacting the health of growing mariculture efforts. Uh, so using farming at sea effectively, where a huge source of our future protein that we are going to consume will likely come from. We need to be mindful of not only the impacts of um, the magnification up the food chain of some of these um, plastics, but also the potential for chemical pollution or pathogens to be transported alongside and attached to this plastic litter. Another aspect of blue growth that we might be able to exploit in this study of the marine plastosphere is whether, in fact, there are groups of microorganisms that might contain novel enzymes that can serve to break down some of the additives that are found in plastic or derivatives of plastic leachates, for example, as it is broken down by things like UV light that is, is very strong in the, in the open ocean and the floating parts of the ocean. So by investigating all the genes present in plastic associated communities and the plastosphere, we might be able to expand our knowledge of these enzymes, uh, many of which remain unknown. Now, that said, we have to be careful to realize that microbes themselves won't solve our plastic problem, but they might in fact provide shorter lifetimes for new materials designed to replace the recalcitrant carbon-carbon bonds of the fossil fuel-based plastics um, that characterize most of the plastic litter today 
that in fact contributes to our biggest marker of the Anthropocene today. Thank you very much, Dr. Zeltler. Another question to Dr. Marcelo Vicky. Dr. Vicky, finally, if you would expose us, the third scientific pillar of the project devoted to the seascape and connectivity and how the activities carried out can lead to a better understanding and management of the Atlantic Ocean. Dr. Vicky, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Carlo. I will do like my colleague uh, Hugo and uh, start a parallel with uh, uh, terrestrial ecosystems because we are slightly more familiar with them. We need to explain what the concept of seascape is. We are all familiar with the landscape, which are the features we observe on land. And we know that vegetation tends to be distributed according to those features on uh, certain mountains above a given altitudes, we find certain types of plants, uh, and you need uh, certain terrain for other plants and so on. Now in the ocean, it is a lot more complicated because of the fact that we are dealing with a moving environment and a very dynamic environment. And that is the concept of seascape. Seascape is an ever-changing characteristic and an ever-changing environment that will affect all the creatures and all species and all types of uh, uh, organisms and non-living components in it. But it's certainly essential for shaping the microbiome. As uh, it's been introduced by my colleagues, the microbiome is planktonic and it's been passively transported by currents. And currents are not just at the surface. When we think about currents, we, got, we get this idea of uh, the big uh, Gulf Stream, for instance, or the Antarctic circumpolar currents, or the big equatorial, uh, uh, the very fast equatorial currents, and so on. But we actually don't realize that currents are a three-dimensional system, and they change with depth. They, of course, become a lot more intensive, uh, sorry, a lot less intensive, but, but at the very end, they still affect the microbial life underneath. And we also have uh, what is called the vertical exchange due to vertical mixing that uh, uh, exchanges surface water with bottom waters and this can happen in several regions of the Atlantic. So understanding the seascape means moving away from the concept that we can find certain species in certain regions, which is relevant, it works, it is a parallel that sometimes work, which is called biogeography. We can characterize certain regions of the Atlantic as hosting, as being home of a certain type of uh, water masses and characteristic, but they can change. And we are very much interested in this project to find out how these regions will be changing over time and under climate change conditions and what kind of expected uh, um, redistribution of organisms we can find. So this component of the, of the project uh, brings together all uh, the activities done in the other pillars that are measuring and quantifying the microbial components and then we connect it with the physics of the transport and this is where connectivity is coming out. So connectivity means that uh, connecting to what uh, Linda has been just saying is that how did plastic get to the most remote regions of the ocean? That means that we have pathways and connectivities that have been uh, taking uh, a piece of plastic from uh, South Africa, for instance, which is one of the, of the largest uh, releaser for microplastic in this case. And then how does it get anywhere else in the Atlantic and how long it takes? What are the timescales? And if we stop dumping plastics in the ocean now, how long will it take to see a change? This is where connectivity comes in. And this is where numerical modeling comes in. We have teams of specialized scientists who run sophisticated high resolution simulations to give us a reconstruction of the various pathways. And then we have other modelers who can transport different types of organisms and see how they will be affected by changes along the way. So by bringing together 
seascapes and connectivity, we can hopefully get uh, much closer to an understanding of what may happen to the Atlantic Ocean in the future when currents are likely to be modified, when frontal systems of colder water and warmer waters will be modified by the ongoing climatic changes we observe at the time. So that will help us to get prepared for changes in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Vicky. So I think unfortunately our time Time is over. I would like to ask several other questions to other guests, but then we have to organize to schedule another podcast. For today, I would like to thank you very much, Mrs. Eloise Trabou, for her participation here. Mrs. Eloise Trabou of Stazione Zoologica Anton Dor in Italy and Atlantic Eco Project Manager. Thank you very much, Mrs. Trabou, for your participation today. Thank you very much, Carlo, for having us today. It was a real pleasure. It was a pleasure for us. And also also, thank you, Dr. Hugo Sarmento, Federal University of San Carlos in Brazil, professor at the Laboratory of Microbial Processes and Biodiversity. Thank you very much, Dr. Sarmento, for your presence today. Thank you, Carlo, for the opportunity. See you next time. See you. It was a pleasure. And thank you very much also to Dr. Linda Maral Zettler, a research leader at the Department of Marine Microbiology and Biogeochemistry at the Royal Netherlands Institute for Sea Research in Netherlands. Thank you very much, Dr. Zettler. Thank you, Carlo. My pleasure. It was a pleasure. And also thank you very much to Dr. Marcelo Vicky of University of Cape Town in South Africa, professor at the Department of the Oceanography and director at the Marine and Arctic Research Center for Innovation and Sustainability. Thank you very much, Dr. Vicky. Thank you. Thanks for hosting us and giving us the opportunity to present our project. It was a pleasure. It was a pleasure. And thank you very much also to you that are listening to us here at the podcast of the All Atlantic Talks podcast. Remember that you can find all the episodes available uh, for downloads in your personal device. You can use Spotify and also find us on YouTube. Thank you also very much to our sponsors, to our supporters, and thank you very much also to our technicians. So see you to the next All Atlantic Talks podcast. Goodbye.